Welcome. I'm here today to have a follow-up conversation with Ken Dykwall. Ken, again, is the founder and CEO of AgeWave and a leading authority on the changes happening in aging and the dramatic changes that we'll see in the future as the boomers turn 80 beginning in 2026. Ken's earlier comments as part of our 2016 Nick Talk series centered on uh, longevity and what that means in terms of a longevity bonus, how people may spend that throughout their lives, but it also centered with very specific applications upon what that means that people in their later years, what are they looking for? And specifically, Ken talked about the desire to feel connected and the desire to feel a new sense, perhaps even a reinvented sense of meaning and purpose. So in the next few minutes, we're gonna explore what does that mean for the field of aging services and specifically for the field of seniors housing and care. So Ken, let's get right to that. Sure. What's standing in our way between what we're providing today, what we're messaging today to our customers who are now in seniors housing and care communities and how we're gonna have to pivot and change if we're going to attract customers rather than totally turn them off when we start seeing the boomers in the next decade. So I've been watching this industry now for 40 years. So I'm a fan and a friend and an advocate, but I, I do think there's some things in the way. First of all, I don't think what's in the way is product. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's in the way is messaging and marketing and communications. Uh, most people still have no clue what it is that is being offered. Uh, is that a nursing home? What is that? Um, They've never been to an assisted living facility. They've never been to an independent living facility. They, they have some archaic notion of it that mm -hmm. they saw in a movie somewhere or maybe their grandma or dad or mom. And I think make a mistake to wait until the boomers turn 80 because people are beginning to contemplate the next stages of their lives now. Mm -hmm. And also if people have formed a negative view or if they focused on the wrong things, it's really hard to turn that around. Well, let's, get, let's follow up on that in terms of what might be giving them a negative view? Because it seems as though one of the things you're suggesting is it's not so much the shape of our buildings, the design of our buildings, but it's the messaging of what we're offering or not offering. Can you explore that a little bit? In other words, if, if, if today they're starting to think about options, are they attracted to what they see out there? And if it's our messaging, what's off base? Yeah, I think the messaging is mostly silent. I think what you've got is ignorance. I think you've got more and more people that are watching their moms and dads age, perhaps in some really unpleasant ways. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at their mom who's living home alone or their dad who has no friends or, or they're, they're, they're already in their 50s and 60s thinking about, huh, how do I want it to be in my later years? They don't see on the morning show, they don't see Oprah, they don't see, uh, you know, in Sunday magazines talking about this fantastic community where they're doing this and they're doing that and people are feeling great and reinventing themselves. Even though I've been a gerontologist all these decades, it wasn't until the last few years that I began to really kind of go down into this world and try to see what was going on. And I have to tell you that I, I was struck when I started visiting more and more of these communities, first of all, people are really kind of happy. They're far more youthful than I expected them to be. They talk often in terms of the freedom they have now, freedom from having to mow the lawn, freedom from having to fix the car, freedom from all those bills, all the different things, and freedom too. Freedom to socialize, to be with friends, to go to the theater, to go to sleep at night without having to worry. And I, what I've been struck by is I just don't think that your sector has done a good job of communicating its offering. And I think there's far more people who would find it exactly what they need for themselves or their parents, and far more people that would start to contemplate it years in advance, maybe even attracting an earlier age resident, which would probably be good for the industry too. I just think you guys have been quiet. I think the industry needs to come together and figure out, we got to start telling our story in some positive so ways. So what would be from your research, and, and mm -hmm. I believe you did some research for V, mm -hmm. uh, formerly Classic Residence by Hyatt, mm -hmm. uh, a major provider of so-called life plan or mm -hmm. CCRC communities. What would be three or four keys to that messaging that would be attractive not just to our residents, to potential residents today, but to the boomers as we look to the next decade? Uh, there's probably a couple that come to mind. First of all, um, connection. Uh, many older people don't talk about it. They're not quite sure how to frame it, but they're lonely. 
they're alone. You know, over the age of 75, 52% of the American public lives alone. People need connections, you know. It's not just about watching TV. Last year, the average retiree watched 49 hours of television a week. People are sitting in their homes alone and got nothing to do but watch TV. Connections, really important. The kind of vitality and someone to watch the ball game with, someone to take a walk with, someone to look after you, share a book they've just read. Connections, peace of mind. There's a lot of worry that people have about their own lives. What if I slip? What if I fall? What if I can't go shopping? What if it's cold? The idea that I can move into a community or a situation where I can get some peace of mind. I can go to sleep at night and, and, and kind of relax because things are going to be okay. And I'm, in a way, I'm being looked after. And by the way, I would say the peace of mind for the adult children is probably of equal, if not more, importance. That 40, 50-year-old adult child who's starting to think it's going to be the case with mom or dad. Peace of mind. And I would, I would land hard on the idea of a uh, chance to reinvent. All too often people think of that decision as sort of the downward spiral. This is the death decision, you know, the waiting ground. I think if people thought of it more as a time to learn how to write poetry, to go to the gym and get rehabbed and become fit again, to maybe fall in love again, or to write your first uh, musical song. Or, we have to start creating environments where people can think, rather than I'm in the wind down, they can think this is a time for new possibilities. And that version of all of these things has got to be made front and center, because if not, in its place, people are thinking about, these are nursing homes, I don't ever want to be in one, and I don't even want to talk about it, and I don't even want to think about it. We've got to put a new notion into people's minds and then create the on-ramps for them to be exposed to it, get a sense for what this might be, and also keep them connected to the communities that these facilities and residences are situated in. Because more and more the boomers are saying they don't want to be so isolated. They don't want to be around just people their own age. That scares let's people. Let's explore that a little bit because the, the, the popular model in seniors housing that grew up particularly I'd say during the night well the last 20 years uh, many people would say it focuses really it's socialization and connection but it's all with people your age and other than that the only people younger that come to that community are either staff or your family is that going to change and are we going to see more multi-generational engagement or are we going to see products lifestyle products that aren't age restricted, but actually where the majority of residents are older uh, uh, elders. So first, we have to understand that there's a pervasive problem in our world, certainly in the United States. Let's call it gerontophobia. Generally, people are uncomfortable with old people, and they're uncomfortable with their own aging. So let's say I'm 66 year old right now. If you were to walk me into a community of people, all of whom were 70 and 80, I think, whoa, these are old people. I don't know that that's for me. So people want to identify themselves as being 10 to 15 years younger than their age. So that first sort of impact where all of a sudden they're being told, you're not young anymore, you're this now, an, an oxygen tank, a walker, yes. all of these which yeah. are very much a part of people's lives when they're in their 80s or 70s even, it strikes people and they don't want a piece of it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. So if people can envision this community as not being an age ghetto, of people older than them, but rather a, a fertile environment for friendship, a place to socialize, a bigger spread of ages. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but if the community weren't isolated, if there weren't a moat around it, yeah. but rather there were programs in the community. You can go to the kids' schools, you can volunteer at the playgrounds, you can take courses at the local college, that it's sort of a, a community without walls will be far more appealing and far more pleasant. And the more that you can bring younger people and younger music, and younger technology and younger activity into these communities, the more people are going to feel alive and well. I don't think people want these isolated old people ghettos anymore. So bring the community into your community, but also find ways to enable your residents to feel connected going out into the community? Yeah, and you know, there's examples we can see in, in other environments. Uh, the, the folks at Airbnb have named what they call modern elders. That's how they're referring to the segment mm -hmm. of the population. It's their fastest growing segment of the population. And there's a whole lot of people in their 70s and 80s with extra bedrooms in their homes. Mm -hmm. This is separate from wanting to use Airbnb when they travel, but they're renting out that bedroom, that lower floor. And college kids are moving in for a semester. Combination of income, but also 
yeah, social they're, contact. And they love it because yeah. the older person was all alone and now there's younger people and they become yeah. friends and they let's go to the movies together. And it's like life comes alive. I've seen communities of older residents where they're inviting college kids or kids mm -hmm. from other countries to live there as well. And everybody loves it. So how do you bring more multi-generationality into the communities? But yeah, you have really got to get those people feeling that this is not my life, it is not a fortress of the old, but that I might be living here, but there's a lot of connectivity. I also think, and I'm going to even ask you what you think, I think we're talking about two different stages. I think that there's a whole lot of boomers in their 60s and 70s are going to realize that they are no longer at work, they're missing the social connectivity, they like to downsize, they got too much house, too much property, too many maintenance headaches. What's a good place for them to live? And that might be a place they live from, let's say, 65 to about 75 or 80. And then this is a generation accustomed to relocating often. Our moms and dads weren't. They might think, okay, I need to step into something with a little more care and a little more security, a little more services added in for the later years of life. Do you think you're going to see this industry get more multi-generational and younger, or do you think it's good to keep it as it is? No, I, I, to your point, we're, we're going to be serving, if we do it right, an age range from 65 to 110. And to say that one size fits all, either in terms of the stage, how you feel about yourself, what you're looking for, I, don't, I, I think it's going to be varied products. I think you're going to have a product which many multifamily developers may be the more innovative ones. It's going to be developed for folks that are 65, but I would push your numbers a bit. I think it'll be with advances that we're seeing in aging and longevity, I think it'll be 60 to 85 over time. And you'll have that 15 to 20 year window, let's say. And uh, then you'll have uh, at where there'll be uh, very little emphasis on health care. There will be on well-being on wellness, right. but not health care. Then I think the 85 or so to 110, maybe it's 120, after some of what mm -hmm. you and others talked about earlier today, uh, where there'll be uh, much more uh, emphasis. Part of this, I think, driven, uh, quite frankly, by whoever's taking risks for those lives in a population health uh, way. And they're going to be working with providers that they think do the absolute best job in terms of chronic disease management, uh, in terms of uh, diet, exercise, you know, nutrition, uh, you know, cognitive stimulus, all of those different things. Again, it will not be socially isolated because you're, st you're going to still have the same people with the same desires. They mm -hmm. don't lose those desires because they've gotten older. Right. But how the sort of what's, what's more emphasized in the community is going to be different. And that's my sense of it. I agree. And keep in mind, too, that the boomers are more likely to find themselves as elder orphans. 25% uh, of the generation had no kids, and on average, boomers had around a little over two kids per couple, which is half as many as our moms and dads had when they had us. So when boomers grow older, there won't be as many of their kids around for them to kind of be looked after by or to take them to the doctor or to socialize with. So they're going to be looking for peers, you know. Uh, people are going to remember how much fun they had when they were at college and they, or they lived in communes. You know, the idea of, of being with a community or a group of people that's kind of fun and appealing and has an interest similar to yours but then allows you to unleash your potential still. People don't want to sign their own end of life warrant. They just don't. Maybe we ought to be more realistic about that, but we're not. We want to feel that at 60 or 80 or 90, we've still got life in front of us. And these communities have got to offer that up. It's got to feel that way. It's got to taste that way. It's got to make people feel excited to join rather than as kind of a resignation. I, I also think that, um, we're going to have to realize that boomers really like education. We were, you know, our parents' generation, their sense of retirement was a time to rest and relax, play some golf. Boomers like classes. They like learning. They like being around interesting minds. And so how can you bring a whole idea of kind of lifelong learning mm -hmm. and unleashing creative potentials in the later years? And I think a lot of our programs are very sort of gentle and elderly oriented. How do we really spike We've them up? We've only moved maybe one stage beyond bingo. And we got to 
we just got to it's it's got to be just a total transformation because bingo is all is is ultimately just saying keep them occupied there's no sense of meaning there's no sense of active learning going on yeah i'll give you an example my wife and i uh, one of our clients is a big uh, cruise operator so we went out and took the baltic cruise last year and most of the people on the ship was a great trip we're over 65 mm -hmm. and what the uh, head of the cruise line explained is that it used to be that people would want to go on these cruises and just kind of stare off the deck and maybe when it was time to pull into a port they kind of followed a tour and then they got back on the boat mm -hmm. and got dressed up for dinner he's saying that you new people coming on they want to lecture the night before about culture, religion, ethnicity, art. They want to be able to go into people's homes. They want to maybe stay overnight and have dinner at a local pub. They don't want to just be kind of follow the rules. And that's the way the boomers are going to view their housing in their later years. And by the way, with the incredible growth in the number of people in that stage of life, for those operators and developers who can kind of figure this out, Big times are coming. I mean, this is as good as it gets. Which means they may want to look at so many of the very popular alumni tour programs that universities do that today are more popular than ever, where professors get the opportunity to then travel and they host 20 alums and it's they give a series of you're lectures. Exactly right. they, it, it's, you're really engaging. You're exactly right. I asked a friend of mine who's an expert on, uh, on, on older adults who travel and he says, you know, the last generation thought it was a great thing if you, you know, dressed up in your suit and tie and you had dinner uh, at a fancy place. He says, new generations, they want to know they can learn something about the food, maybe learn how to cook a meal, mm -hmm. meet the chef. Uh, find out about the culture where that wine was grown. There's a different generation coming up. And you're right, where do you see examples of it? With these alumni clubs and the way people want to keep learning. Um, fitness programs where people go to Canyon Ranch or they go to the you know, Rancho La Puerta and they make friends and they're there to kind of get younger, to grow healthier, to turn themselves into kind of a healthier, more positive version of themselves. You're going to see examples, you know, come from places like Esalen and spiritual retreats where people in their later years want to make sense of their lives and, and, and you know, write their memoirs, write their journals. I was at a focus group the other night and an older uh, man says what he'd like because he has 10 grandchildren and they're all little he says he'd like to have a hologram film made of him and he's a musician so that his grandkids when he's gone can see him playing the piano and see and feel and get a sense for who he is as a human being so this is not a guy thinking about you know rolling up in his bed and going and taking a nap he's thinking about how does he keep himself alive for future generations and at the edge of all of these interesting innovations is where these communities are going to have to find themselves and become the environment of choice. I'd rather be there than staying in my own home. I'd rather be there than kind of wandering around the suburban neighborhood. I'd rather be there than having to drive or manage my own car. And I just think the opportunities are endless and the amount of creativity in the field is thin. Mm -hmm. So I think there's intelligence about architectural design. I think there's intelligence about operating costs. I think there's intelligence about staffing. But when it comes to creating the life that people want, I think the creativity is thin. And with life, what you're really talking about is creating that sense of connection and purpose and meaning, because that's something that boomers want and are going to be looking for. You know, retirement literally means, you know, to disappear, to go away. The boomers, hell no, we won't go. I think you're hell right. no, we won't put mom in a nursing home. That led to the explosive growth of assisted living, particularly driven by the firstborn adult uh, daughter. Mm -hmm. And then in the 2020s, they're going to say, hell no, we won't accept your version of retirement. We ain't going away. Right. We just did a survey, a massive survey in partnership with Bank of America, and we asked people as they grew older, uh, what is their biggest fear? Their biggest fear, right up there with, you know, Alzheimer's is being a burden on my family. Mm -hmm. So here you have a generation that either they're not sure if their kids will want to take them in or look after them, or they don't want to disrupt their lives the way perhaps they had to do with their own mom and dad. Here's a generation, tens of millions of them, saying, 
I want a life that's secure, that's comfortable, that's fun, where I can continue to achieve my potential and I don't want to be a burden on my family. Man, if there was ever an open door for this industry to step in, it's now. And I don't think the industry should say we should wait 10 years until the boomers are approaching 80. I think we need to create the on-ramps over the next several years so that people start talking about it. So when you go out to dinner, people aren't just talking about the fun vacation they just took or the new job they're thinking of, of participating in or their volunteer preferences. They're beginning to talk about, wow, they checked out this thing. They got a buddy who's living in that community over there, and it's amazing. You want the word of mouth and the new story. It's all about the narrative. You want a new narrative to this industry to take hold and then have people coming to you because mm -hmm. this is, in a way, the satisfaction of their dreams. Well, you're, that's the reason we're having these conversations about aging, Ken. Thank you very much. This has been a, uh, a fascinating further discussion. One last question, which is getting into <laughs> detail, but it's, it's an important detail. So many people uh, from an operations point of view, development, a lot of capital has gone into very specific memory care communities, Alzheimer's being a main form of, of, of uh, dementia, but many others as well. What do you see as the future of that? Is that a sort of subspecialty? Uh, you know, how, how do you see that product type evolving? Well, you asked me an important and serious question. So there's a Greek myth in which uh, this beautiful goddess, her name is Eos, falls in love with a mortal man, and she wants him to be able to live forever. So she goes to Zeus and asks that, this Tithonius, this warrior, be granted immortality. Mm -hmm. And Zeus said, are you sure that's what you want for him? And she says, yes. And as she's leaving Zeus's chamber, she realized she forgot to ask for health. And as the fable goes, this once proud strapping warrior became older and sicker and his bones broke and his organs rotted and his brain became demented, but he couldn't die. This is not the version of aging that anybody wants. Unfortunately, right now, what we're seeing is that as we live longer, the rates of, for Alzheimer's and related dementias is 47% over the age of 85. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a plague. That's a pandemic. And there's over 5 million Americans right now with Alzheimer's and related dementias. I happen to be of the school that would like to wipe this disease out. You know, just like in the 1950s, in the early part of the decade, people thought there'd be iron lung sanitariums in every neighborhood because poliomyelitis was rampant. And Jonas Salk, who was a friend of mine, I collaborated on a book with Dr. Salk years ago, he said, we gotta wipe this disease out. My feeling is we need to wipe out Alzheimer's or else it's gonna be the sinkhole of the 21st century. However, that's not gonna happen in the next three to five to 10 years. And so we're going to have millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people with Alzheimer's and related dementias who are going to need to be cared for in loving and kind and respectful situations. And whether that's at home with 24-hour care, which is massively expensive, or it's in communities with memory centers, there's no question that that is going to be a key part of the next decade. However, if I had my druthers, I'd like to wipe this disease out and cause the need for those memory centers to be ended. Hopefully, in addition to uh, wars on poverty and races to the moon and even a war on cancer, we can add a concerted national effort to really address Alzheimer's. I think we need. I think we need to beat it before it beats us. And um, but in the meantime, that's not going to happen today. I wish it did. We're going to have a decade or more. Probably more. Yeah. And. So there, the need is real, the need is there, and then the question is if we were to find some sort of a therapeutic intervention for Alzheimer's, would it stop it in its tracks, or if you already had it developed, would you be still st stuck with it in a sense? And so there's clearly a need. I think the memory centers were a brilliant idea. I recognize they're kind of euphemistically named. Uh, but the need is high, and especially as we have more elders with Alzheimer's without children to look after them, because 80% of the care given right now is given by their adult family members, with a smaller number of children, these elder orphans are gonna need communities where they can be looked after. Well, thank you, Ken. Our purpose in having this discussion is to generate a discussion about aging, and particularly the challenge that business as usual will not cut it. Exactly. As we continue on in the aging services and particularly seniors housing and care field. Your contributions through the years have been enormous. Thank you for your time that you spent with us today. I Thank you, Bob. It. Great Thanks. to be with you.
That concludes this conversation uh, with Ken Dykwald. We encourage you to continue this conversation. How, do this, how does this make you think personally about your own ideas about aging, retirement, longevity? And what are the implications for the business, product, or service that you're engaged in serving our nation's elders? Thank you for being with us. Thank you.